Well, we're joined now by the UK's Defence Secretary, Ben Wallace. Uh, uh, Mr Wallace, thank you very much for being with us this morning. We've seen in Alex's report there just indiscriminate bombing of civilian areas. Uh, how is the war going at this point, stage day 13? Well, it's not going particularly well for the Russians. It's day 13, way off their timetable. Uh, you know, one level, sadly, the sing you know, there's a lot of casualties. We've seen the indiscriminate shelling, which has obviously killed numerous uh, civilians. We've also recognised that probably the biggest single casualties so far in the war are Russian military soldiers who have uh, been let down by appalling leaders, appalling leadership and appalling plans, and now you see them literally uh, at large scales um, dying. And I think that is you know, something that will be interesting in the Kremlin, whether they will admit to each other the failure of their aggressive and illegal invasion of Ukraine. We've seen the column is still stuck uh, north of Kiev, there are reports overnight of Ukrainian special forces destroying, uh, you know, over 20 uh, Russian helicopters on the ground. Uh, and I think we can see that the Russians are having real logistic problems. So that affects morale. They're not getting through. They're getting more desperate. And you can see them getting more desperate because they're shelling more and more innocent people, just, you know, trying to even get out on humanitarian corridors, as we saw yesterday. And I think this goes right to the heart of the challenge for Russia, which is Russia has built itself a trap and it's sent itself in. The international community is united against them and now we see uh, the devastation that they're leaving behind. We'll come on to a lot of that in a moment, but you saw in Alex's report there, Petro Poroshenko, the former yeah. uh, president of Ukraine, uh, calling for more Western support. We're going to hear from President Zelensky later today, who will, no doubt, call for more Western support. Are we doing all we can? Yeah, we are increasing our support of both lethal and non-lethal aid to Ukraine. We're continuing to deliver them throughout the country. Uh, we started off, obviously, with 2,000 uh, N-laws. That's light anti-tank weapons. Uh, we've changed and increased both the N-laws and others. And I'll make a statement tomorrow, I think, to Parliament to give the details. But Britain is stepping up, doing that. We're supporting the coordination of delivery throughout Ukraine. Uh, and, you know, we were the first, really, to do this uh, mm -hmm. in Europe. And we did it, obviously, uh, early in January, way before the invasion. And so uh, we're in a good place to make sure they get better defence and more defence uh, and I'm in touch with my colleague in, in Ukraine quite a lot to get to know what's going on and what they need. I mean, there is some talk as well in the past couple of days of uh, reinforcing the Ukrainian Air Force by swapping out jets, essentially, from NATO members. Poland has been mentioned with uh, jets that the Ukrainian Air Force can use. Uh, your thoughts on that and whether that's a, a viable thing to do at this stage of the war? Well, first of all, there's, only, there's very few nations that fly the MiG-29s, which are the same aircraft that the Ukrainians fly. So the United Kingdom's aircraft would not be able to, to be offered. Uh, and so there are only a few countries who potentially could uh, accept a request by the Ukrainians. I would support the Poles and whatever choice they make, it's those... Whether they choose to... Whether they choose or not. I mean, you know, those countries are on the borders with uh, Russia and Ukraine to some extent, and so they will face a direct consequence. And so we would protect Poland, we'll help them uh, with anything they need. But if they make that choice, uh, then that's a choice they would have made based on a view of bilaterally helping Ukraine and Ukraine needing those. Now, I think Ukraine should have whatever it can have uh, to protect itself, to defend itself from this naked Russian aggression. So, to be clear, then, you would support a NATO member essentially rearming uh, a bordering country against Russia? Well, I think I would support their choice. With, with like, you know, fighter you know, jets. You know, all of us in these jobs have to balance the risk of escalation with helping what we see on the ground. I am responsible for the security of the United Kingdom and the people, and so is the Prime Minister. And, you know, we have to make sure uh, that the consequences of whatever actions we do, lethal aid included, which, you know, the Russians have warned there'll be retribution for, for countries that have done that, is calibrated in the right way to make sure that there's not an escalation into a war across Europe. Poland borders, you know, a number of countries such as Belarus uh, that is an active participant with Russia in this war. And Poland will understand that the choices it makes will not only directly help Ukraine, which I think is a good thing, but also may bring them into direct line of fire from countries such as Russia or Belarus, and they will have to calibrate that. And that's a really big responsibility on the shoulders of the President of Poland and, indeed, the Defence Minister. And so it's not for me to second-guess their choice, but it is for me, as a fellow NATO member, to say I will stand by Poland. Poland is our 
ally, it's been an ally for over 150 years, the United Kingdom. We will support Poland in whatever uh, choice she makes and also whatever she needs as a result of that. OK, Mr Wallace, let's move on then to the migration issue, of course, as you know, millions of people on the move. Let's just, uh, I want to show you this picture here that we have that's in a number of the newspapers this morning uh, and that we've been featuring on Sky News. That is the train station at Kharkiv. I mean, you know what that is reminiscent of, don't you, from the 1940s. We can do more to help these people, can't we? Some 300 visas have been given by the UK. 10,000 wants to come here. Can more be done? And what do you think about what you see there at Kharkiv? Well, look, that's what war in Europe looked like 70 or 80 years ago. It's what war in Europe looked like today. And I think it's why uh, people like me and the Prime Minister were determined to help Ukraine defend itself long before others were, because that was going to be the consequence. We warned uh, many countries in Europe who were not of the view Russia would invade, that, that the risk were great. Migrant flows are what happens in war. And, you know, we, we've got used to wars a long way away, mm. where people arrived on these shores and European shores in drips and drabs. Uh, as they made it across uh, a territory. Th these people are neighbouring the EU, they're mm -hmm. neighbouring Europe, uh, and quite rightly, they're in a city that is surrounded by Russians who are indiscriminately bombing them. Uh, of course we can do more, and we are doing more. And I mean, I... it's shameful, isn't it? There's thousands there, and 300 visas have been given. Well, look, they're processing 17,000. So 17,000 people have applied, and they're being processed at the moment. And we've so said, we've said over 200,000 people can come here. So the question really relies on how many checks we do once people reach a safe space. So, so no one is stopping those people getting across their borders into a safe space. Mm -hmm. And the first and foremost duty for all of us is to make sure those people get to safety. Yeah. Once they've got to safety, making sure we just check their identity before they come to this country is incredibly important that we do that. It shouldn't take time. And I've offered, you know, and I will be offering to the Home Office assistance from the MOD in the same way we did not pitting, to increase the processing time to help those people. Uh, but, but of course, you know, we have been incredibly generous and we will continue to be so. We've said over 200,000 people can come to this country. I mean, 200,000 people can come from Ukraine to Yes, the they can come under the... There's a range of schemes. There's a humanitarian scheme. There's the family scheme. They can come to this United Kingdom. The key here, and I understand the frustration, is the speed of processing when they get to a safe country. And that's the problem, isn't it? The speed of processing, because you will know that there have been stories in the past 24 hours of people at the UK border in Calais, unable to get across, even though they have every right to come here. Why is that being so well, so, so I know the Home Secretary is, is determined to speed that up. And, you know, the MOD will lean in, as we did. So, so you're not pitting. We, we sent MOD officials to help the processing of identity mm. to make it even quicker. We will play our part in speeding that up. You know, we have people in Poland, for example, and the, the, the Ministry of Defence, uh, as, as does the Home Office. They've done a pop-up visa processing centre. But she recognises there's more to do, you know and that she that will do more. You know what's there at the moment is inadequate. You do admit that, don't you? Well, look, look I, I've said we can do more there, and we will lean in to do that. You know, this is fast-moving. The first duty is to, for the government to help people get to safety. And once they're in safe countries, Poland or anywhere else, the next responsibility is to make sure we process them as quick as possible. Of course we can do that quicker. We are leaning into that. The Home Secretary is determined to do that quicker. I will give her all the support I can in making sure it's done as quickly, quick as lightning. OK, uh, uh, Mr Wallace, finally then, uh, President Zelensky is going to address uh, MPs today via video link. He's been described as a, as a lion, a, a real totem for this war. Uh, what kind of moment is that going to be like in Parliament when he speaks to MPs? I think it's going to be incredibly powerful. You know, um, President Zelensky I've met on a number of occasions. You know, he is leading a country at war. I don't think he ever thought when he was elected, uh, as no one else really did or few people did, that Russia was going to come and decimate his country. You know, he is an amazing guy. He's a, he's a, he's actually comes across as a very regular person. Um, it's been an incredibly unifying moment for Ukraine. You know, the last president you've just seen on your uh, footage, you know, there's a joke in Ukraine that, you know, Russia has done one thing that the Ukrainian people hadn't managed to do, which is unite the former and the current president. You know, that's what happens when you invade a country. President Zelensky is the spirit of Ukraine, which is young, which is liberal thinking, which is outward facing, which is European. And that's what Russia or President Putin just doesn't understand. This is about values and who we are. This is not about the military threat that was sort of made up by, manufactured by Russia to itself. It's about the values. And President Putin doesn't like the values that are represented by NATO and the EU. And that's what he's most angry about.